church. So, Brother Mark, you come lead us in these good hymns. Amen. Page number 23. Can't think of a better song. There is power in the blood. Amen. 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 Page 23. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Power in the blood. Would you There's got to be some power in the blood when you take off on a Thursday night. It's wet and it's rainy and you come out to the house of God. Yes, Amen. Yes, sir. We get to that course. You help me out now. I sing there is power. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Would you do service for Jesus, your king? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Turn over just a couple of pages to page number 30. Nothing but the blood. Amen. Amen. Song says, what can wash away my sin? Yes. Nothing but the blood. Amen. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other bound I listen. Nothing but the blood of Jesus for my pardon. This I see. Listen. Nothing but the blood of Jesus for my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All right, ladies, you sing nothing for sin can atone. And men, you answer it with nothing but the blood. Amen. Here we go, ladies. Nothing Men, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Ladies. Nothing. 
nothing but the blood. Amen. Good, good. Everybody. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. One more time, ladies. This is my What? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And all God's people said, Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Thank God for the blood. Well, men, those that will, let's gather around this altar and uh, let's pray everyone else can be seated. Pray at your seats if you'd like to. But uh, Brother Kevin, come on up. I want you to lead us in this prayer and then stay up here after you pray. I'm going to you do something in just a moment. And uh, we want to pray and see God every night, every night. There's been a certain theme, if you've listened very carefully to what God has done through the preaching, but every night has been different. It's been very special. God has moved in this place. And I am through. I cannot wait to see what God wants to do this evening in this place, in these messages, in these sermons. So let's all pray together. Men, you cry aloud to God. And let's see what God wants for these services. Brother Kevin, you come and lead us in this prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord, I, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for allowing us to gather freely in your house, Father. I thank you, Lord, for the power coming back on, Father, that we may have our services tonight. I pray, Lord, that you just have your will in your way, Father. I, I know, Lord, that you have something special in store. If the devil was fighting that hard earlier just to have the power off, Father, I know, Lord, that you have something special in store for us. I pray, Lord, that you be with all the scene, and I thank you, Lord, for the scene that's already been done, Father, the sweet spirit that's already made its presence in here, Father. I pray, Lord, that you just have your will and your way. I pray, Lord, that you be with Brother Ben as he comes to mount this pulpit in the next few moments, Father. I pray, Lord, that you just use him in a mighty way. I pray, Father, that you just anoint him with your spirit. I pray, God, that you just remove distractions, Father. We have an open heart to be receptive of everything that you have for us, Father. I pray, Lord, that you convict our hearts, Father. I pray, Lord, that you... Place your finger on parts of our lives, Father, that need to be surrendered to you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you be with all the singing that will be done tonight, Father. I pray, Lord, that you have your will and your way with that. I pray, Father, that you be with Brother McBride as well as he mounts his pulpit in a little bit, Father. Oh, God, I pray, Lord, that you just use him in a way that you've never used him before, Father. I pray, Lord, that you give him a clear conscience, a clear heart, Father, that nothing will hinder, Father, that you just work in a mighty way in his life as he preaches the word, Father. I pray, Lord, that you just give us all what we stand in need of. Father, we'll give you all the honor. We'll give you all the glory and all the praise, Father, because you alone are worthy for it all. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Well, it's so good to have uh, Jessica here, Brother Kevin here, some others. we got three. we got three at Crown College now, don't we? Four. Okay. four at Crown. I, that's right. we got four. Jessica made number four. That's right. we got four at Crown College now, and we're thrilled about that. And uh, Pax Branch should be very happy about that. And I go to some churches... Maybe maybe more people, bigger facilities, different areas, and they don't have nobody in Bible college, and uh, that's because they didn't have pastors to tell them they need to go to Bible college, and we're thrilled that they're in a place like that, being trained to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. What better thing can you do with your life than serve the Lord Jesus Christ? And uh, so, Brother Kevin, could you come just take a couple minutes, and I know this is a ministry weekend for them. And this is not fall break, this is fall ministry break. And uh, so I don't know what all else you're going to do this weekend, but take a couple minutes. Tell us what God has been doing with you at Crown College and uh, how God's using you down there. Well, I'm so glad to be back, you know, being away all, just any time from home, it's really hard. I, I love Temple Baptist Church, I love Pastor Seth, and it has a wonderful place in my heart, but there's just something about Pastor Eric and Pat's Branch Baptist Church that I, I just love with all of my heart. Yeah. I thank you all for all your prayers. Uh, as Brother Dale said, this is our fall ministry weekend. They just give us a few days every semester, but we have spring ministry weekend as well. Not just to let us go home for like a break, but they s emphasize that ministry part. They allow the students midway through the semester to go back to our churches, go back home, and go wherever it might be to minister to our churches, try to be an encouragement, try to help in any capacity 
that we can. So I've already talked to Pastor Eric. He's, he's probably got me a boatload of stuff already <laughs> waiting for me. He's probably been waiting for that all summer. He, he had me doing it all summer, so it's, it's been stacking up. So I probably got files worth back there to get done while I'm in this weekend. But the Lord's really just been working on my life this summer. I mean, this summer, this, this summer as well, but this semester, you know. I, I feel closer to the Lord than I've ever been. And one thing that the Lord really convicted me about recently is worshiping Him. You know, I started thinking about it, Brother Dale. I started yes, thinking about what are we going to do in heaven? For all yes. eternity, we're going to be worshiping yes. God. Yes, sir. And yes. that just started ringing true in my mind. Absolutely. And I started thinking about that, and I started thinking about the fact, why don't we worship Him here? We're going to do it for all eternity, so why don't we just get a few years' experience ahead of it? Absolutely. And, you know, that's definitely changed my life. Recently, I've been challenged by a friend that's a teacher of mine. Uh, you know, we, we had our midterms just a few weeks ago, so, you know, some, some, of, us, some of them was kind of frustrating he did, but I think the Lord definitely put it on His heart to do this. But He came in... We were supposed to take our midterm. It was our last class today, so everybody was ready to just get our midterms done and leave. You, you all know how that is. And he came in. He talked for like 15 or 20 minutes. He just started talking and talking and talking. We couldn't take the test because he had a password on it. He hadn't given us a password yet, so we couldn't, we couldn't take our test. And he started talking more and more, and I just kept, he kept getting my attention and getting my attention. He, he started talking about living every day expecting God to break through. He said it in a sense of like, today could be the day. Today could be the day that God could change everything in your life. Today could be the day that God will break through in someone's life that you know. And he started talking about that in church. He started talking about how the fact, you know, sometimes we come to church, it's so habitual to us. Up at Sunday morning, I'd ought to go to Sunday school. I'd ought to go to Sunday morning worship service. I'd ought to go to Sunday night service. I'd ought to go to Wednesday night service. But he started talking about the fact about how we let it become so habitual to us. We don't come with the expectations that God's going to change lives. Because God has the power to change lives. God has that power. He, he's talking about how today could be the day that you could go to church and God change someone's life. God could change your life forever. And that's so run true in my life. I try to remind myself that every single morning that I wake up, I, I, I just, I wake, I've said it as my phone screen. It just says, today to be the day. Yes, I have it written in the car. It says, today to be the day. Yeah. And you never today to be the day that the Lord could return. We'll be worshiping Him for all eternity. But God has just done such a wonderful work this semester. I know the Lord's really worked in Jess's life from what I've heard with Isaac as well and from what I've heard with Andy that God's just working in such a mighty way. God's really just been moving in my life. We had our conference last week at Temple, so I had church Sunday through Wednesday. And then Pastor Jared Shoemate from Taze Valley, he's pastor down there in Knoxville. He had his missions revival Saturday through Tuesday, or through last night, and then now I'm back here for this. So I've been surrounded by so much preaching, the Lord has definitely stirred me up, and I'm fired up. I just want to see God move in such a mighty way. The Lord's really been working on my heart as well in the aspect of soul winning. You know, the same teacher, he's talked about it several times. We ought to be looking at souls. We ought to be looking at people. The person across from us pumping their gas, they're going to spend an eternity somewhere. And we could be the only person that tells them how to get to heaven. And just the Lord has been working in such a mighty way, and I'm just so thankful for everything that the Lord has done. Hadley, you come get ready to sing, and Brother Ben's going to preach after the message. And uh, Brother Kevin, we're so proud of you. Thank you for working hard, sticking with it. Jessica, and then uh, Andy, I don't know if you'll be able to watch any of this. We're proud of him, and Isaac, and uh, all them that are serving the Lord. And uh, Pastor Eric, it was an amazing thing when Dad came over 30 years ago, you know, there wasn't much said about Bible college or Christian schools. So it took 30 some years for these things to fall in place. And uh, we just, we've seen an example of a pastor that stayed faithful. And uh, now we have some young people that just sold out to God, just give their life to Jesus Christ. And uh, I want to encourage every parent, every grandparent that's watching, that's in here, tell your children to serve God. There's nothing better. There's nothing better. And that they'll not get rich. They'll not have great careers. But that's not why we're here. We had a missionary many, many years ago that came and said something about young people. And this is wonderful if this is what God wants. But said something about being doctors, lawyers, and the big careers. And there's nothing wrong with that if that's what God has for you. But he made this statement. I'll never forget it. He said, but in a church like this, there should be preachers. There should be missionaries. There should be servants of God. And I agree with that. 
And I believe we're watching God do that. And if the Lord doesn't return, I believe He is. But if He doesn't, it's His timing. If He doesn't come, I believe the greatest days are ahead for Pax Branch Baptist Church. I'm excited to see what God wants to do. And I want to add sing a song. I wrote this not too long ago, a few years ago. And uh, I wish it happened this way every time, Brother McBride. I was reading my Bible. It's one of, and I'm going to be honest, it don't happen this way every time. But it's one of those days. It was literally as if God was jumping out of the pages. I didn't want to shut my Bible. But then I, finally I just stopped reading. And I, I began to pray. And I didn't want to stop praying. It, I was literally so afraid that if I opened my eyes, just God's face was there. He was so real at that moment. I wish it happened every day for me. <laughs> But every now and then, God's just so sweet. Every now and then, God just reveals Himself so much in the time of devotion. And I remember that particular time, and I wrote, I wrote this song, just a testament. We all have testimonies of what God is to us. God, God is an amazing God. God is everything. What's that mean? Anything you need, that's what He can be for your life. At that moment, what you need, that's what he can be for your life. And I remember that time of devotion. And after, finally, I didn't, I didn't want to stop reading my Bible. I didn't want to stop. I wish it happened this way every day, but it don't. But that day, I didn't want to stop praying. But finally, have you ever, kind of, kind of like it's been this week or in some me, have you ever just, it's been so much, you just had to stop. You couldn't take it no more. And that's kind of how it was. And I got my pen. And I just wrote a testimony song. This is what God is to me. Hadley, you say. Savior, life eternally. Spirit, righteousness in me. Righteousness in me. Father, truth when you speak, holy words of pure body, words of pure body, you are my friend. My sight when I can't see, you are the day inside my darkness, that's what you are to me, that's what you are to majesty ruler mighty king of kings mighty king of kings you are my friend when I am lonely my sight when Eternally, Spirit, righteousness in me. That's what you are to me. 
Well, come on, Brother Ben. We're so glad to have you. This is Brother Ben Dixon. His dad is Pastor Steve Dixon of Porter's Grove Baptist Church in Maryland, Rising Sun, Maryland. And uh, he's been hanging out with us a little bit in the last few months. And he's praying about where God wants to put him in Bible college or whether he wants to go to Bible college. And I just want him to do exactly what God would have him to do. And I'm excited. He told me a little bit about what God, may, what God is doing through this message. And I'm excited to hear what God wants to do. So I'm going to pray for him. And uh, then you listen to him as he brings the word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this young preacher. God, that has a desire to serve you, to live for you. God, I pray that you would touch him tonight like you have never touched him tonight. Lord, help him to understand this moment, what it means. Not, not just to speak, not just to say words, but God, to preach in your power with your touch upon this message tonight. Thank you for what we will hear. Help us to listen as he opens the word of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on, Brother Ben. Amen. Let's turn, turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter number 55. Uh, I, I was preparing, for, I was meditating on this message last week, and, and I, wasn't, I didn't really have peace about it. I wasn't sure what I was going to preach, and this, this passage of Scripture has just been visited and visited this week, and God sure gave me peace about it. I want to direct this message towards ministry. I believe that's where God uh, has led this message to go. We're given a work to do. And I believe through this text, it'll help us to understand what that might look like. Let's read verse number one. It says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Let's pray this evening. Dear Lord, I come to you, Lord, so thankful. Lord, to be able to be behind this pulpit this evening. God, I pray that you'd rid myself of me. Lord, I pray that you'd fill myself with you. Lord, that I might preach exactly what you'd have for me. God, I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to look first tonight at the proprietor's price. That word proprietor there means owner or keeper or holder. So, of course, we're talking about our Father, God. And I'm so excited about this truth. He says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, thirsteth, Come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. You see, Christ has already paid the price for us to sit at His table and to eat. You see, that word ho there, in the beginning, it's, it, it means, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a burden, it's a, it's a plea to come. And I believe that this can be a plea to salvation. I also believe that this can be a plea to ministry. You see, aren't you thankful that, that one day when you realized you were a sinner and you realized that you were able to come without money? You were able to come. I, I heard a song and it said, it said, I'm sure glad that God doesn't need anything because I sure don't have anything to give Him. And I'm sure glad that God had everything, uh, that has everything that He needs and that he, I, I, have, I have nothing to do with my salvation. I'm so glad the only part I play is accepting. God has paid the price. I heard a song and it said, uh, it said come and buy without money. Come and feast without pay. The king has opened his banquet hall to the beggar, to the outcast, and to the slave, and I'm sure glad that includes me. You see, and then he says, he says in verse number two, he says, Wherefore or why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight in its fatness. You see, we always, we're always working. We're always striving, and we're laboring, and we're chasing something that we'll never catch. Maybe for you, it's your work. Maybe for you, young person, it's your school. Maybe even you're in Bible college and you're so focused on getting your work done. You're so focused on, on checking all the boxes, on doing all these things, and the Lord is saying, why are you chasing something that doesn't matter? Why are you chasing something that has no value in eternity? You see, you can have all the money in the world. You can have all the, all the fame and all the, for, all, the, all the fortune, but in verse number one, it says you don't need money to do my work. You don't need money to fulfill what I've given you. 
You see, those who reject Christ, those who are fighting against God, are striving to satisfy their soul. They're striving that we're, we're running and we're trying to find something that will give us peace. Yet we're rejecting Christ. I believe we can fight God sitting in church. I believe we can fight God being a part of a quote-unquote ministry. You see, it seems like we're working for the Lord, and yet we're finding every bad thing about our church members. We're finding every bad, we're trying to criticize everything that the Lord is doing instead of just letting the Lord lead. You see, we also need to understand that, 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 we don't, that since we don't offer anything to our salvation, that there is no one that we can minister to who God doesn't think is worth it. I, I think many times we look and we, we see someone who say, that, that looks like someone I could see sitting in the pew of a church. That looks like somebody that, that, looks like somebody that could be a Christian and say, I, I'm going to go talk to them, but but we'll see a homeless man. We'll see a poor old drunk going down the street. And we'll say, you know what? There's no hope for them. But the Bible says, come and buy without money. You see, if we only, if we only witness a conventional way, if, we only, if, if we're only willing to do things in the way that we've always done them, we're only going to reach conventional people. We're only going to reach people that are conventional, people that look normal to us, but that is certainly not what Christ did. Christ went to the, to the uttermost. He, he sought the maniac of Gadara. One that no, nobody really wanted him to get saved. Everybody just wanted him to go away. And it's not, and it's not as if Christ was, was going down the road and He saw him. He sought him out. And, and I think, how many times have I sought somebody out? How many times have I saw someone who was hurting? Have I saw someone who, who's got no money, who's got, who's got nothing to their name, saw someone that's needing something. There's a Christ-shaped hole in their life, and they're trying to fill it with drugs. They're trying to fill it with alcohol. They're trying to fill it with everything that this world has to offer, and they find themselves searching for something they'll never find. How often are we finding those people? We see the proprietor's price. We see that, that salvation is free. Next, I want to look at the people's purpose. The, our purpose. You see, we are given a purpose through Christ. And I want to promise you, it's not sitting in that pew and keeping the gospel in your pocket. Let's read verse number 4. It says, Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Listen to verse number 5. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. And nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. We are given purpose through Christ. You see, we are living in a world of people that we already talked about are desperately searching for something that will fill a hole in their lives. You see, we are living in a world that's filled, filled with people that, that have believed the lie that, that there, was a, there was a big bang one day, a couple things exploded and they were created. And they have no purpose and they're trying to find anything in this life that will fill their soul. And here we are with hope. Here we are with the only thing that can help them, and we're the most silent. You see, they believe, that, they believe that loving everyone will help. They believe that world peace will help. And we hear all this noise from everywhere else, and yet, yet the church is silent. We're given, we're given a purpose, and we ignore our purpose. And we say, we say, you know what, I'm just working too much where there's people at your job. You say, I'm at school too much where there's people at your school. You see, God has put you in a place for a reason. We, we, we often believe that even, even as Christians, we think our life is just, is just falling apart. We believe that sometimes we just think that, that there's no way that there could be a purpose for my life, but God has a purpose for you. You are, in the, you are in the place that you're at for a specific reason. You are in here tonight for a reason. We ignore God's purpose, and I believe this is the reason for unhappy believers. You see, we're the only people on this entire earth that have a purpose that's worth living out. We're the only people that, that can find true joy. And, and yet we're content to sit in a pew. Yet we're content to, to be lackadaisical Christians. You see, we have a purpose. We've seen God do too much to be silent. God is too good and hell is too real for us to be silent. We see the people's purpose. We wonder why our ministry isn't successful. And I want to go back to verse number three, and I believe we'll find why. You know, we, we, we find ourselves, we're striving for numbers. We're striving for a response. You see, you might say, I don't have a ministry. I don't, there's, there's nothing, 
If you're saved, you have a ministry. That, that word ministry only means reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if you're saved, you ought to have a ministry. You say, you say, I don't, I'm just not seeing what I want to see. You see, I've, I've witnessed to people and I just, and I, I've been doing what I thought I should do and yet I just, I just, I'm just so discouraged. But listen to verse number three. I believe this is the reason, uh, our lack of this is the reason that, that we don't see uh, what we want to see. It says, incline your ear and come unto me here and your soul shall live. I think often, you know, you say, I'm praying, I'm praying, but, but maybe your prayer sounds like, Lord, please do this. Lord, please do this, and, we're, and we've refused to hear Him. We've refused. We're, 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 we're fine to talk to Him. We're fine to tell Him what we want. We're fine to tell Him what our vision is for our ministry. Yet we refuse to listen to Him. It says, incline your ear and come unto me here, and your soul shall live. And, and obviously, if it says your soul, your soul shall live if you listen, what happens to your soul if you ignore what happens to your soul if you're not listening to God? It is dead. It says in verse number five that it says uh, in the middle of that verse, it says, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God. For, and, and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. When you're at your job, when you are living out your life, are there people that are seeking you out because of your God? Are there, are there people that are looking for you because they know that there is something different about you? Or are you just another worker? Are you just another, another man that's coming into work? People should see something different about us. There, there should be something, and I'm not talking about the way we dress, although there, there should be. And I'm not talking about you know, all, these, all these things that we seem to care about. I'm talking about your heart. I'm talking about your joy. I'm talking about your love for people. If... It, if someone, if your boss came up to you and said, you can't, you know, we're, 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 we're doing a new thing and you can't, you can't talk about God at work. You can't, you know, you, you can't be, uh, you know, you can't be preaching about Christ at your work. Would your conversation change? Would it impact the way that you speak every day? Would, would, would there even be a difference? I wonder. You see the... See, they said that to they said that to the apostles. They took them and they were in per, well, they weren't in prison yet. They were they were uh, being they were being judged and they were they were being taken captive. And and they said, you can leave as long as you don't speak of Christ anymore. They said we can't do that. They said when I speak, all that comes out is Jesus Christ. Is is your devotion to God so strong? Is is your daily reading is it is it blessing you so much that you just that you wake up, you read your Bible, and you go to work, and you can't, that, there's nothing you can talk about but how God's blessed you that morning. You can't help but share what God's given you. We have a purpose. We have an important purpose. Please don't be content to sit in your pew tonight. Next, I want to see the promiser's pardon. The promiser's pardon. This is what we're sharing. This is the good news. Listen to verse number 7. It says, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Aren't you glad there it doesn't say, let the good man, let the good woman come unto me. It says, let the wicked man, let the unrighteous man. I can't, I can't identify as, as someone, who is, someone who's been good all the time. I can't identify with someone who's, who's just been almost perfect all the time. And, but I can't identify as a wicked sinner who God's forgiven. You see, we have forsaken God. Every day we have woken up and we have chose sin over God. You see, in the moment that we sin, we are saying this sin is more important to me than pleasing God. When we, when we wake up, we, we have a decision to make. We can serve God or we can serve Satan and, and don't fool yourself into thinking that there is an in-between. You see, in the moment of sin, we are saying that sin is more important to me than God is. We have forsaken God. Yet, Yet the end of that verse says, let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. That word abundantly means more than enough. And if he just forgave us, you know, just for one sin, it'd still be more than we deserve. Yet he abundantly pardons. We see the promiser's pardon. Lastly, I want to see the provider's person. The provider's person. In verse number eight, it says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. 
For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, He's higher than us. We get so frustrated when maybe we're in our church and the, and, and the service just isn't going the way we want it to go. You ever feel that way? You ever feel that way, Pastor Eric? You're just you're frustrated thinking, Lord, why aren't you meeting the way I want you to? But you see, God has a purpose. You see, God has a plan. His ways are higher than your ways. You have a plan for your ministry, and that's fine, but God will most definitely break your plans. Things don't go the way we ought to. God has a plan, and we can either submit to Him and let, let our ministry be what He would have it to be, or we can fight Him. We have, we have two options. So go on in verse number 10. It says, For as the rain cometh down, and as the snow cometh from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. You see, God is, not, God is not moving in these meetings so that you can be the same tomorrow morning. I believe that if you have listened to these preachers, and if you have let God minister to your heart, then He has this week. And He is not doing it so that it won't do anything. He's not doing it so it can... So it can go through one ear and out the other. You see, God is sovereign. God does nothing without purpose. God is not... You see, you are not in this church service tonight without God knowing that you're there. God is not speaking to your heart on accident. God is speaking to you for a specific purpose so that you can reach that one. So that you can grow in the Lord. You see, growth is impossible without sharing the gospel. You see, you can... You know, the, it seems like the church today is so self-centered. We want to we wanna, uh, see, what, see what the church can give me. We want to see what God's Word can give me. And those are good things, you see. It's good to grow in the Lord. But there comes a point where you've hit a ceiling where you cannot grow anymore until you share the gospel. You see, this is our mission. And so often we think that it's our mission to, to be in a pew, to check the boxes, to be here on, on, a, thir on a Thursday night. You know, that's, that's, that's what we're here to do. But... But the truth is, if you're keeping the gospel in your pocket, you are a failing Christian. God is sovereign, and God has a plan for you, and God has a plan for your ministry. You might think, I can't serve the Lord. You might think, I've done too much. There's too much holding me back. Listen, Moses said, Lord, I can't speak. God had a plan. Paul was a murderer. God had a plan. God met him where he was. Think, think about this. Paul was on his way to go murder God's people. And he met him there. He met him on the road there. You think you're too far gone? You think, you, you think that you're unworthy to serve God? We all are. But it, but it just said that that doesn't matter. Come and buy without money. Come and feast without pay. Paul was a murderer. Peter, de Peter denied Christ three times. Yet God saw it fit to use them. And I want to promise you tonight. Now I'm this is not my promise. I believe that this is God's promise. God wants to use you tonight. God has a plan for you tonight. God has a plan for you tomorrow. God, God, is, not having, God is not moving in this meeting without purpose. Yet you'll know it's a good service if you live it out tomorrow. Don't let it die out. I want to pray tonight. I want to close this message and then I'll have Brother Dale come up. Dear Lord, I come to you so thankful for your word. I come to you so thankful, Lord, for who you are. Lord, I'm thankful, I'm thankful that you have a purpose for my life. I'm thankful that you have a purpose, Lord, for each believer. Lord, I pray you'd help us not to ignore it. I pray, Lord, if there's one here tonight, Lord, that, that maybe has been struggling, Lord, with submitting to you, Lord, I pray that they would bring that to the altar tonight. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, preacher. Well, it seems like God, all week, every service, has uh, been showing us what we should be doing in his work and his family. And uh, there's been, I thought about this as he was preaching. There's been a lot of people that's in heaven now that used to sit in this church and in these pews, and they were faithful, they were servants, and uh, they would do things for the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything the pastor would ask them, they was willing to do it. I'm going to tell you something. We need another generation to step up and say, now it's my turn. And uh, I can't imagine, I can't imagine what God has planned for this church. 
And uh, I'll tell you, it'd be a good idea Sunday when you come back to church and just come to your pastor, what do you need? And uh, I'll do it. I'll do it. Seems like that's the theme. I don't know why God wanted that this week, but it sure seems like I've asked myself, God, God, tell me what else to do. God, what can I do? God, help me. Show me how to do more. Lord, what can I do? Everywhere I go, I represent this church, Pax Branch Baptist Church. I don't have Dale Vance Ministries. That's ridiculous. That even sounds funny. I'm sent out from the Pax Branch Baptist Church. And I remember first prayer cards. You know, my mentor, my hero, Brother McBride. And I didn't have much money, so I just told Allison, just print as little as you can, you know, and she didn't put our church on there. And first thing, Brother McBride said, aren't you a local church evangelist? Yes, sir. Well, your church is not on there. Well, I noticed that, you know. And uh, try, to, try to do my best for Jesus, praise God. And uh, we're sent out from this church. And... Uh, but, oh, I could do so much more. Couldn't we all do more? What can we do for the Pax Branch Baptist Church? And what can we do for Maranatha Baptist Church and all the local churches that are written? Thank you, preacher. And I don't ever, ever, ever discourage a young preacher. And uh, I'm getting ready to discourage Brian McBride, I think, though. Last night he kind of gave his age away. And uh, when I met you, you was about my age when I met you. And, uh, but he through, <laughs> through all these years... <laughs> He has never, never discouraged me. I'll go different places and they'll say things like this. Hey, Brian McBride told me about you. Brian McBride said something about you. He's never discouraged me. And that let's not be a church that ever discourages young people from serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, let's still be, I believe this has always been a church that's encouraged young people. Let's do that. Thank you, Brother Ben. We're going to keep praying for you. And we're going to pray it's God's will you go to crown. And if it's not God's will, we're going to change his will. No, I'm just kidding. You go where God wants you to, and you stay faithful to what God. And God may not even want you in Bible college. I think he probably does. But if he don't, you just follow the Lord. Be faithful in your local church. And do what God wants you to do. And that God sure has blessed this week, hasn't he? I've enjoyed this meeting so much. And that we still have one more night. Pastor Eric, if you can come up just for a moment, tell them about this offering. And you know this, you understand all this, but there's some people watching. We want to make sure they know how to give. And uh, we want to do as best we can for Brother McBride, for the others that are here. And uh, I said this already, Brother McBride's working overtime, you know, so we got got to help him out. Normally you get, get time and a half with overtime, so y'all can do whatever you want with that. But we want to help him out, be encouragement to him, be a blessing. And Miss Bethany's been singing. What, what a song she wrote last night. Amen. And uh, that, was, that was wonderful. That, and I love history, so that helped me. But that was an amazing song. And uh, we need to bless God. Amen. Pastor, my dad, he talked about that. And uh, we need to bless God. We need to do something for him. That's been the theme. we got to work for the Lord Jesus Christ. Tomorrow night, Brother McBride will be preaching. Only have one preacher because the Braves will be in Atlanta tomorrow night. And then we have... <laughs> God punished me last night, so if y'all want to know what happened last night. But anyhow, Brother McBride will be preaching, and the reason, not all the time, but sometimes we just have one preacher, because we truthfully, seriously, we want to give him all the time in the world. We just want to enjoy Jesus tomorrow night. We're going to have time of fellowship tomorrow night, so don't forget that. And uh, I think the church is providing the chicken, I think, is that right? Somebody in the church, so the chicken's provided for, all that kind of stuff. So bring, uh, bring some other dishes, bring desserts, all that good stuff. Banana pudding, all that, you know, code word, that kind of stuff. It's hashtag it now. It's not code word, hashtag, you know. Hashtag banana pudding, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, so uh, let's be faithful to that. And, and stay with us. Let's enjoy our fellowship together. If, if you feel safe to do that, if you don't, that's fine. If you don't want to eat with everybody, get, get over there before they get there. Grab you some food and take it home. That'd be okay, too. And then do this. Be back in your place Sunday. Be faithful. Let, let not this meeting be in vain. Let's come to the house of God, to Pax Branch Baptist, to Maranatha. I'm going to be at Greenwood Baptist in Winchester. I think, Brother McBride, you're going to be at New Grace. As you start Sunday. Let's be in our place. Let's be faithful. Let's find out what God, let's drive a van. Let's knock on a door. Let's do something for God. Let's fill a Sunday school room. Dr. Jerry Falwell, before he ever pastored, he uh, was at his local church, and he'd come home between 
Now, this is Dr. Falwell. I'm not saying you got to do this, but he come home between college in the summer, you know, and, and his pastor, he said, Pastor, what can I do? What can I do? A young Dr. Falwell. And he's like, well, man, we, you got a Sunday school room? Yeah, I got a Sunday school room. Just start a Sunday school class, you know. By the end of the summer, he had over 300 people there. Now, that's a way to get the church to grow, you know. Find a Sunday school room. Do something for God and uh, be in your place Sunday. Brother Eric, you come and uh, tell us about this offering and uh, let us know what we can do tonight. Well, you all have been faithful to give all week, and I appreciate that. Our, our people here have always given to it. Uh, when Pastor Vance started at camp meeting years ago, and I appreciate you giving to it, sacrificed, and uh, you've given. And if you don't have any more to give, I'm not going to ask you to give anything that you don't have. But if you do have it, um, let God lead you and direct you in that. But um, you, there's offering plates in the back as you leave. I appreciate the men watching those um, each night. And then if you're watching online, you can go to the church website and click on the donate button. And I think we take all forms of credit cards and IOUs, checks, anything like that. Uh, but I appreciate you all giving. I've enjoyed a camp meeting. It's helped me. Has it helped you? Amen. It's been a blessing. So we want to keep it continuing. I'm one of those young people that Brother Dale's talking about, right? Amen? Yes. All right, so uh, we want to not no more. We want to keep on going, keep on continuing for the Lord. So uh, that's that's how you can give. Okay. Amen. Hey, let me say one more thing. Yes, quick. Um, there's a uh, CD set sign up sheet in the back. If you want a copy of the CDs for the camp meeting, I know in this day and age, you get in new cars. If you can find a new car, um, get in a new car. It doesn't have a CD player anymore. Different ways of listening to the services, but we still have CDs that we're going to have available. So uh, you sign up for that. If you're listening by online, send us a message. Let us know you want that as well. And uh, make a, a quick announcement. There are the tape, the old tape tables, the CD book tables in the back for the McBrides. And then Adelie has the CDs as well. If you don't have any of those, make sure you get those. Okay. Amen. Thank you, preacher. I, I love to tell this story. And um, we, me and Rachel was just out visiting years ago for Bible school. And uh, a lot of the people in the church, man, many came out that Saturday to visit for Bible school in the church. And dad just wants to pass out flyers for Bible school. And we knocked on the door at PAX. And, uh, and Brother Eric, our pastor, came to the door. And he's 12, 13, whatever it was. And he, he literally, he acted the same then. He was no different. And uh, just so kind. And... Uh, he was so, so, and uh, Brother Mark was pastoring then, and said, and we invited him to church, said, well, we got a church, you know, that kind of thing. So we got Bible school, and they came to Bible school. Now think about this. I, I, I wasn't doing nothing, just doing what you're supposed to do. Little did we know our pastor is here tonight. God used just one visit, one knock on the door. I wasn't necessarily out soul winning. We told some people about Jesus that day. We just invited them to Bible school. Look what God did. Isn't that an amazing thing? So every, every door we don't knock on, every track we don't pass out, all that kind of thing. I wonder what we missed. I wonder the times that I was supposed to be out doing that and I wasn't doing it. I wonder what door I didn't go to. I wonder what I missed from a church. And uh, let's be faithful for the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, what God wants us to do. And all because of what Jesus has done for us. Thank you, Brother Ben, for that great message. We want to sing about some of that. Page number 208. Let's stand and sing. Let's stand up for a little while. Grace that is greater than our sin. Page number 208. Let's sing it out now. As the come. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that extends our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was shed. Amen. Sing. Grace, grace. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin, sin and despair like the sea waves cold threaten the soul with infinite loss grace that is greater yes grace untold points to the refuge the mind 
sing that last verse again. I love the Brother McBride. Why don't you come on up, get ready, and we're going to sing this last verse again. I love this song. A great song of doctrine. We're saved by His grace. We're kept by His grace. We're cleansed by His grace. Let's sing this last verse as they come. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe you that are longing to see his face will you this moment his grace now sing it out receive grace grace god's grace grace that will pardon and cleanse Within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sins. Amen. What a truth in a song. Thank you. you. May be seated. So good to have the McBrides with us. We appreciate Miss McBride playing and uh, laboring, working. And I keep, I keep saying we ought to pay Brother McBride extra, but I don't know if that's true. We ought to pay her extra. She's working the whole service. We appreciate them, what they're doing. You let, they're going to sing as many as they want to, and then let's listen to Brother McBride. Let's listen to what God has through the man of God, through the Word of God tonight. All right, hold on here just a second. I was listening on the um, live stream and I couldn't hear the guitar, so I'm gonna try to so get up there and see if that is that on. Fellas, on the mic. Okay, good. All right, thank you.
and sing, and sing because I'm glad and free. My Lord, We'll get Becky to sing this song. It'll help her a little bit.
All right, Matthew chapter 27, please. Thank you for being here in the Thursday night service. Thank you again for all your kindness toward us this week. And thank you, Brother Ben, for that good message. I love that chapter. And uh, it's always a blessing to think about that buying without price and without money. <laughs> Amen. When you go back to, well, I'm, I better get off that or I'll get, I'll get stuck up. I'll get stuck up in there. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I, I was, uh, last night I couldn't sleep and I was up most of the night and uh, 
So I was studying and I had a message and I had it prepared uh, for us tonight, but I don't think I'm going to preach it. I'm going to deal with something else in the passage here in uh, Matthew chapter number 27. And we're going to start reading in verse number 45, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 45, and maybe tomorrow night <clears throat> we'll deal with that what I had in mind for tonight. We'll just take a little detour tonight. Matthew chapter 25, and starting in verse 45, we've dealt with some of these verses. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with the vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. I want us to think about these verses for a moment. Verses 27, or excuse me, 47 and 48 and 49. And I want to talk to you for a moment about some truth from the thirsting of Christ. The thirsting of Christ. Now there, there's a great deal could be said about this passage. A uh, great deal to be said about some explanations about the vinegar and so on. Earlier, when Jesus was on the cross, they gave him vinegar mingled with gall, the Bible said. And when he tasted it, he would not drink of it. The reason he wouldn't drink of it, it was because the vinegar was, was used to help the thirst, but the gall was used to dull the pain. And Jesus, I believe, uh, would not take that because he did not want the pain dulled. In other words, he, did not, he wanted to suffer the full measure of the wrath of God. But here we are later in the, in the crucifixion and Jesus needs a drink or at least there is a man here who believes he does. It may be that, that Matthew has not, he has left out here what John will tell us that Jesus said, I thirst. That may have happened, I'm not sure, but it may belong right here. But I'm thinking about this man who came and brought a drink to Jesus. And i tell you what we're going to do. We're going to, uh, we're going to do last night's message, part two. Okay, part two. I want to talk to you about this man. I was reading this passage and certain words when I read them in the Bible just kind of jump out at me. I don't know my brain works a certain way. Verse 47, some of them, some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calleth for Elias. So there are some of them that are involved here. And then the Bible said in straightway, one of them, there was one of them out of that some of them that did something about what he heard and what he saw. And then in verse 49, there's the rest or the rest of them who didn't do anything about it. He said, let me, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. And I thought to myself, I don't want to just be some of them and I don't want to be the rest of them, but I want to be one of them. I want to be the one that does something for the cause of Christ. I'm thinking about this, this kindness. Now, depending on who you read, I, I, I don't know how many uh, commentators I read about this passage, and if you read enough Bible, so-called Bible scholars or Bible students, they'll get you as mixed up as a termite in a yo-yo. You'll get about as many, one preacher said, you'll have as many opinions as Carter has pills, and I have no idea what that means. I just heard somebody say it over and over. Brother Kelly used to say it. Apparently Carter's has a lot of pills. But, uh, but I, I don't know. Some say that this man was doing something to try and harm the Lord Jesus. Some say that he was mocking.
mocking the Lord Jesus, but some that I read, and this is the way I read it when I first read it, uh, I believe he was trying to help the Lord Jesus. There was a small kindness that took place here. This man hears Jesus uh, call out for help, and this man comes uh, to try and help the Lord. Now you say, preacher, who were these men? I'm not sure who the some of them, or the one of them, or the rest of them were. Uh, some that I've read said that these were Jews, and that's why they said something about Elias when Jesus said, Eli, Eli. Others said that a Jew would not make fun of Elias. They might make fun of Jesus, but they would never make fun and taunt about Elias. So I don't know if they were Jews. I don't know if they were Romans. I don't know if they were bystanders. I don't know who they were, but this one man gets my attention in this passage, and I'm thinking about what he did for Jesus, and I'm thinking about you and I in our lives and doing the kind uh, being kind to folks. We already heard about it a little moment ago when our brother preached that good message about doing something for the cause of Christ. So I want to I want to give you three thoughts tonight. I don't think it'll take me very long, and uh, but I want to give you three thoughts about the kindness of this man. The first thing I want you to think about is this: it was a small kindness, a small kindness. You say, preacher, what do you mean a small kindness? Well, the first thing was, it was not a costly deed. It did not cost this man a great deal. Sometimes people say, well, I, I, you know, if I do something, it doesn't mean much. It didn't cost me much. Sometimes it will cost you a great deal to do something for God. Sometimes there'll be a great cost involved. There'll be a great weight involved in it. But oftentimes it's just a small thing that makes a difference for the cause of Christ. I go down and I preach uh, uh, every year. I've been doing it for almost 20 years now. I preach at uh, Anchor Baptist Church for their share They're raising money for Christian radio and that's live radio and internet all over the world. I think when I preach, uh, we sing uh, during the day and then I preach every afternoon at, at uh, 2 o'clock and uh, I preach all over the world on the internet. There'll be people listening in 40 some countries and a lot of time every state in the union we're preaching all over the place and I'll, I'll start that on Sunday and I'll preach Sunday morning, Sunday night then every afternoon at 2 and then sometimes I'll go preach somewhere Wednesday night and then the second Sunday I'll preach the morning service and what they call the rally service in the evening or the they call the rally service at the beginning, they call it something else at the end when they've raised the money and thank God every year they raise the money because I don't know what in the world I'd preach if they don't raise the money but uh but anyway, I tell you that, tell you this, when I get into town, I always get into town just a few days early. I, I have a meeting and I'll go Sunday through Wednesday and it's usually in uh, Waycross, Georgia. And I'll leave on Thursday and I'll drive up uh, to uh, Pisgah Forest, North Carolina, and I'll get up there. And then on Thursday night, or sometimes not Thursday, but every, usually every Friday and sometimes Saturday night, I'll go preach for Brother Shane Jackson and Landrum. South Carolina and I preach the gospel down there and they are a wild crowd you start reading the scripture they'll start shouting and so I, I got I'm so I've driven I've preached Sunday through Wednesday in Waycross I've used my Thursday to drive up there and then Friday night I'm going to go preach and every year when I go there are two fellas there's brother Dwayne Whittemore who's been involved in missions for I don't know how many years he's an elderly man loves God a great preacher a tender heart and then brother Ron C and Brother Ron is a mechanic and he's been involved in the work of God there at Anchor. They have a disaster relief uh, uh, program and ministry and he keeps all the semis running and he'll move preachers for free just for gas, you know, when they're moving and all that sort of stuff. And so when I get up there, Brother Whittemore, I won't call him and I, I, won't, I won't ask him anything, but he'll call me and he'll say, now are you preaching for Shane Jackson on Friday night? And I said, yes, sir. He said, we'll pick you up so you don't have to drive down there. Brother Severs and I will come and get you and we'll drive you down to the meeting and you can preach and then we'll drive you back. Now it doesn't cost them a great deal and it's not an earth shaking event but it always means a lot to me that I don't have to think about that and worry about that. It's one of those small kindnesses. They were able to do it. You know what happens to us sometimes? Here's what we do. We say this is what I'd do if I could. Well why not do what you can? instead of what you could. 
Why not say, well, if I was like so and so, no, why not say this is what I am and how God made me and so I'll do something. It may seem small compared to what others do. That may not seem like a big deal to some. That the man of God would drive me down to preach may not seem like a big deal to much, but it seems like a big deal to me and I'm sure it seems like a big deal to God and I'm sure he remembered for it. It was not a costly deed. It was not a clamorous deed. What do you mean, preacher? It did not draw the attention of the whole city. I don't read where anybody said, hey, look at that man, take that, that, that uh, vinegar. Look at that man, put that vinegar on that sponge. I don't read where a big tumult was made about it, but here it is in the Bible. God took note of it. Uh, doesn't matter if society notice it. Doesn't matter if the neighbors notice it. Doesn't matter who notices it, as long as God notices it. So it was a small kindness. It was not a costly deed. It was not a clamorous deed. And here's another thing. It was not a circumstance changing deed. So what do you mean, preacher? It didn't get Christ off the cross. It did not make the difference in the plan of salvation. It did not change anything. It was not a cataclysmic event. But it affected Christ. You listen now. You say, well, preacher, I would do something, but what I could do would not affect the whole world. Who cares? What's important is this. Did it affect the someone to whom you did it? And here's another thing that's important. It affected the person to whom you were kind, and it affected you. Did something to you. I remember Dean McNeese preaching one time, preached a wonderful message on reaching the world. And here's what he said. He said, I had it in my heart. I wanted to reach the world. He said, I wanted to, I, I got started in the, in the ministry and I was pastor in the church. He said, I wanted to reach the world. And that's a wonderful thing to want, to reach the world. It's a wonderful thing. I'd like to reach the world. I'd like to make a difference in the world. But he said, I, I, I wanted to reach the world. And then he said, I was pastoring in this town in a certain state. And he said, I, I prayed about it. He said, I felt like, you know, if I could just reach my state for Jesus, if I could just reach everybody in my state for Jesus, maybe I can't reach the whole world myself, but maybe everybody in my state. And then he said, the more I tried to minister around there, he said, I decided I, I need to reach my city for Jesus. That's what I'll do. I'll reach my city. And then he said, one day, I was sitting out on the on the porch and there was a young fellow that would ride his bicycle by my house and he'd ride by every morning going somewhere and so he said one day one day I, I looked at him and he said the Holy Ghost said to me why don't you reach him why don't you reach him and so he did. I, I went out and I, I ministered to him. I witnessed to him. I talked to him and I led him to Christ. And in leading him to Christ, it set my church on fire. And my church got on fire and it made a difference in our community. And he said because it made a difference in our community and people began to give to missions, it made a difference in our, in our state and then in our country and then our missions program all around the world. See, we got the thing backward. We said, well, I, if I could reach the world, no, let's do this. Let's reach that one that rides the bicycle past the house in the morning and see what God does with them and when we reach that one that small kindness that uh, it doesn't change the circumstance of the whole world but it changes our circumstance and then it bleeds over into the rest of the world a small kindness God loves we're not we're not supposed to despise the day of small things and little is much when God is in it so here was a small kindness not only was it a small kindness it was a single kindness. And here's what I mean. He had to do it alone. Nobody else helped him. Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. But that's all they did. They just talked about it. And then he ran and filled the vinegar, put it on a reed, gave him to drink. But the Bible said the rest said, Let be. They said, Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Let, let it be. Let it go. Let us see whether Elias will come to save him. So here is a man, he's, he's done a small kindness, but he had to do it on his own. Sometimes you're going to have to decide to do something for God on your own. I love it when we fellowship together and we work together and try to do something for the cause of Christ, but sometimes he's going to have to say, I'm going to do something for God. I'm going to do something for God. How come these others did not help him? How come? Well, maybe because they were heartless. They had no heart for it. Those in verse number 47, some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calleth for Elias. So they wanted to talk about it, but they didn't want to do anything about it. 
They wanted to have a discussion. I remember, I'm thinking it was David Livingston. He was going to Africa and he wanted to go on the mission field and he was sitting, sitting there in the service and the, and the deacons were there and he w- then he got up and he presented his ministry and he was excited and finally one of the old deacons said, sit down young man, when God gets ready to save the heathen, he'll do so. Well, I'm going to tell you something, friend. I'm not, I'm not for that fatalistic attitude. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not going to, I don't want to just sit around and talk about it. Let's do something about it. We can plan and plan and plan and plan. You know, I hate to bring up the Civil War here because I'm in enemy territory. But, uh, but uh, we had a fellow fella who was a great general for the North. He's a great general for the North as far as, as far as doing drills and as far as dress parade and all of that sort of thing. But he never, he had that army ready. He had them marching. He had them, he had them drilled. He had them prepared. But he never wanted to go into battle. I'm afraid that's what happens with us. We plan and we prepare and we say we ought to do this and there's a need here and we get it all laid out but we never do anything. I'm glad there was one fellow who said, you know what? I'm going to do something about this. They were heartless. Others were hesitant. They said in verse 49, let let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Sometimes we don't do anything because we want to sit back and see how it's going to turn out. Maybe the, maybe the church starts a visitation program and say, well, I'll, I'll go visit, but let me just see how it turns out first. Maybe the church wants to run a bus or a van route. We run a van route. Somebody says, well, let's just see how many will come. You know, I, I had this fellow, I was pastoring the church. We were getting ready to have, and they were faithful to our church. And we were getting ready to have what we called uh, um, Anniversary Sunday and Miracle Sunday. And we ran about, when I took the church, we ran about 49. And we were building up a little bit. And, and we were trying to have, I think we were trying to have 150 on that Sunday. We ended up having 166 on that Sunday. But anyway, I said, I want to have as many folks here in the service so they can hear the gospel, get under the sound of the gospel. So this fellow who'd been in the church ever since I'd been there, I knew him. He came up to me and he said, now, preacher, he said, uh, we had one bus. We'd send the bus route out. And he said, now, I'll help you fill that bus Sunday. I said, really? He said, yeah, I can fill it. I said, you can? He said, I can. So he started telling me all the things he's going to do. He said, we're going to have tickets. We're going to go out and knock on doors. We're going to say we're having a big Sunday, but you can't come unless you have a ticket. I thought, well, that's odd. He said, oh, no, you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised how many young people will come because they have to have a ticket. And he said, it'll draw people. So man, he came in that Sunday, there was arms and legs sticking out of the windows of that bus. It was illegal, I'm sure, there were so many children on that bus. It was loaded on that bus. But that's the only time he ever did it. Never did it before then. Never did it after that. He'd talk about it. But he was hesitant to be faithful at it. Let's not be hesitant about the work of God. I'm glad God wasn't hesitant about sending his son to die on the cross for me. I'm glad the preacher wasn't hesitant to preach when I got saved. Let's not be involved in the wickedness of watching. Let's not, let, let's not, you know, let's not just say, well, it'll work out. It'll all, it'll all work out all right. Let's not do that. Some were heartless. Some were hesitant. Some were hopeless. I'm sure somebody said, one drink's not going to make a difference. One drink, one one little taste of vinegar, not going to make a difference in this whole scheme of things. But you'd be surprised how one deed of kindness, one act will make a difference. You say, well, somebody's life, they look hopeless. There isn't anything I can do. Well, this fellow finds himself in the Word of God, finds himself recorded here in the midst of this, finds himself, and I mentioned this a little bit last night, finds himself involved in fulfilling the Scripture. It was not a hopeless deed. It was a helpful deed. It was an important deed. It was a single kindness. He did it because nobody else would. Wouldn't it be good if all of us say, you know what, I'll fill that need. I'll be that one. It was a small kindness. It was a simple kindness. It was a signature kindness. A signature kindness. What do you mean? Well, though he was not called, he answered. He was not sure apparently what Christ wanted. They were confused about what Jesus had said. He said this, they said, this man calleth for Elias and straightway one of them ran, took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. Though he was not sure what Christ wanted, he knew what Christ needed. 
Can I say this to you? I believe there's a call to preach. I believe in, in being a God-called preacher, and I remember when God called me into the ministry. But I would say this to you. One, one of the preachers I used to spend a lot of time with said this. He always had this saying. He said, see a need, fill a need. See a need, fill a need. So I said, well, preacher, there's a need for this. Well, there wouldn't be a need if you'd fill it. Or if I'd fill it. I'm going to go to the, when, when I'm home, I'm not home. I'm the ideal church member. I'm never there, but I always send my tithe. Preacher, don't have to put up with me. Amen. Because I travel all the time. I get tickled because people say, what time's your church start when I'm home? And I'd say, I'm not sure. I hadn't been there in seven months or so, several months. But when I'm home, I try and fill the need if I see a need. When I'm in the service away from home, when I'm in the church service, if there's a need, I try to fill the need. Somebody has to fill the need. Somebody has to say, you know, I could help with that. I could do that. Though he was not called, he answered. And then, though he could not be recompensed, he gave. He wasn't going to get anything back for what he did. I don't, I don't read where anybody thanked him. In fact, I read where those around him said, don't do that. Let it be. Let's see if Elias will come. Some were around would say, no, you're wasting your time. He wasn't going to get anything, he wasn't going to get anything from it, but he did it anyway. In 1 John 3, 17, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? How is it that we can say we love God, and that we serve God when we see a need, but we won't fill it? How is it we can say that when we say we won't do anything unless we're going to receive something back? I remember one time, I, we had one bus, we ran one bus, and so I was... I was downstairs in my office and getting ready for the morning service and it was, it was about 15 minutes before the Sunday school was supposed to start and here walked the bus captain and his wife into my office. Now, if it's 15 minutes before church and the bus captain's in my office, that means the bus ain't on the road. And I said, uh, they said, can we talk to you? And I said, yeah. And I said, uh, sit down. And, and he said, we don't want to sit down. I said, okay. Uh, what's up? And he started to say something, but before he could say anything, she stepped out and she said, I worked hard on the mother-daughter banquet. And your wife thanked everybody but me. Now what had happened was Sherry had had back surgery. And she hadn't been able to be there for some time. She'd been staying with her parents and, and she wasn't going to be able to come to the mother-daughter banquet. So I said to the ladies, I said, now Sherry can't help with the mother-daughter banquet. They said, we'll take care of it, preacher. And they invited, they said, it, you, it, if you'll come and preach, we'll feed you. I said, I'll be there. <laughs> and so I went that night and it just so happened that Sherry was able to come to the banquet that night. And so she's sitting in a chair and ladies are coming. She didn't go to anybody. Ladies are coming by her and telling her how glad they are to see her. And, and she said, well, thank you so much for work. Well, this lady never came by, so she didn't get thanked. So she said to me, we're leaving the church. I said, leaving the church? She said, your wife thanked everybody but me, and, and we're leaving the church. Now, they didn't leave the church. We, we kind of got it worked out, but the bus did not run that day. But here was the problem. Would you look at me? Here was the problem. She thought that the reason you served was because you got a thank you. What she didn't realize was the reason we serve is to say thank you. We don't serve so somebody say thank you for what you did. We serve to say to Christ, thank you for what you did. It doesn't matter if anybody notices. Doesn't matter if anybody pats you on the back. Doesn't matter if anybody shakes your hand. Doesn't matter. We do it because of what Jesus did for us. That same man, David Livingston, was standing, the mission, great missionary to Africa, was standing in a group and he was talking in a service about, about what Christ had done and they were asking him questions about what had gone on in Africa and one of them said to him, they said, tell us about the great sacrifices you've made for God in Africa. And here's what he said. He said, sacrifice. What sacrifice? How can it be called a sacrifice that which is in a small measure an attempt to pay back a great debt that is owed? How can you call that a sacrifice? 
Oh, friend, it's not a sacrifice to serve God. It's not a sacrifice to do something for God. He wasn't going to get anything back. He, nothing, nothing in return. But he did it anyway. And here's the third thing about that makes it a signature kindness. Though he was opposed, he continued. What did they say to him? They said, don't do it. Let be. Don't go over there. He did it anyway. The world will oppose our service. The devil will oppose our service. Sometimes our own flesh, sometimes even those among us will oppose our own service. Say, so what do you do? Just do it anyway. Just serve God anyway. Just be busy for the Lord. I thought about this and I wrote this down. He had little opportunity. You and I have exceptional opportunities. Oh, what we could do for God. All oh, the difference we could make. He had even less encouragement. You and I have great encouragement. He had limited time. You and I have our entire lives to do something for God. In, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15, the Bible said that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Now this is a time of darkness, a time of trouble, but in the middle of that time, here's a man in my estimation who shines with his kindness to the Lord, what he did for Jesus that nobody else would do. And you say, oh preacher, we're living in a dark time. Well, if you're living in a dark time, that's a good opportunity to shine your light the light always shines brighter in the midst of the darkness so I say to you let's do something for God Matthew 10 42 whosoever shall give to drink one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple verily I say unto you he shall in no wise lose his reward small things let me ask you a question did you do even a small thing for the cause of Christ today? Did you say a word? Did you give a witness? Did you give a testimony? Did you do a small thing? Say, preacher, I can't do a great big thing. Then do a small thing. And you know what God can do? He would take a small thing and turn it into a big thing. He could take a small effort and bring about large consequences if we'll just be faithful. Those are some truths from the thirsting of Christ. Let's bow our heads a moment. The Bible said in Galatians 6.10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. If we have opportunity, let's take it. There's something you could do. We talked about this last night. I told you this is last night's message, part two. Last night, someone made a garment. Tonight, someone gave a drink to a thirsty man. What could you do? There's something. I felt like tonight I was going to preach on something else, but I feel like God directed me to remind us again. Let's do something for the Lord. One missionary said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ shall last. We sang the song this week, I want my life to count for Jesus. For earthly things will quickly fade. The verse starts out like this, men all want their lives to count for something. They want to be remembered when life is through. But the truth of the matter is, time will wipe away all we do. Unless it's done for eternity. When I, I'm a Michigan football fan, don't hold it against me now. But I, I remember reading one day one of the oldest rivalries in college football is Michigan and Ohio State. I remember reading one day that in the Michigan locker room there was a sign over the door. And it said this What did you do? to beat Ohio State today. Now the game was who knows how far away. But what the coach was asking them is what little thing did you do today to help you going to win that game? I want to ask you this question. What little thing did you do today that would count for eternity? What would you be willing to do 
that would count for eternity. Now, Father, help us tonight in this invitation. And I pray, Lord, we'll not despise the day of small things. I pray tonight, Lord, that we'll be people of kindness. We'll be people who will do something. We'll be people who will see a need and fill a need. We'll be people who will say, you know, there's something. I could do that. I pray tonight, Lord, this would be a ministry. And it, I, I'm sure it has been, and I want it to continue. But the ministry of Pax Branch Baptist Church, every member would say, this is our ministry. This is our work. This is what God would have us do here in this place. I pray each one of us, Lord, purpose in our heart, we're going to do something for Jesus. Help us now, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet a moment.